Here in the United States, we have some of the best healthcare in the world, but it's also some of the most expensive healthcare in the world. The cost of US healthcare is estimated to be over $4 trillion today, and that cost number is increasing. Also, despite having some of the best clinicians in the world and having the pharmaceutical industry come up with several new treatments day after day, clinicians still struggle to figure out which treatment to use for which patient. Consider, for example, a patient with newly diagnosed multiple myeloma. There are about 10 or 15 new treatments that could be used for patients with newly diagnosed multiple myeloma, a blood cancer. But only 60% of patients who receive that first-line treatment have a, um, but only 40% of patients who receive that first-line treatment have a very good or better response. And the key question is, which among those 10 or 15 treatments would work best for this patient at hand? Now, as a patient, one often struggles to make it through the healthcare system. It can be often very difficult to diagnose, to understand your diagnosis. It can be very difficult to understand your treatment options and what the follow-up has to be. Now, I am an AI researcher here at MIT working in the healthcare area, and I think that it, we have an incredible chance to try to improve both of those pain points. Why? Well, because today we have data, and we have data in electronic form due to the widespread adoption of electronic medical records here in the United States. And coming with that data are breadcrumbs telling us a story about the patient's past medical history and what's going on with them today. And that data we can use together with AI and machine learning methods to predict many of the, many of the um, challenges which we can now address with these, uh, with these algorithms. So let's think about these two scenarios. First, how can we use AI to augment clinicians? And then how can we use AI to augment patients? We'll start with clinicians. So in a recent work together with Mass General Brigham, we looked at the question of how one could um, could guide the selection of treatments for urinary tract infections. Urinary tract infections affect one in two women in the United States. And when a woman uh, has, a, has symptoms of urinary tract infections, typically one would just prescribe an antibiotic to try to resolve those symptoms. But the key question is which antibiotic to prescribe? The way that this um, could be done is you take a sample, uh, for example, a urine sample, and you send that sample to a laboratory, which will run what's called an antibiotic susceptibility profile. And what that's going to do is going to see, okay, it'll try several different antibiotics, and it'll see which ones succeed at resolving the infection. And the reason not all of them would succeed is because there's a lot of antibiotic resistance uh, today. So you can imagine looking at those results and saying, okay, the bottom three antibiotics here would succeed, and we could choose one of them and prescribe that. The challenge, however, is that that data could take days to get back. And one has to make a decision at the point of care of which antibiotic to prescribe, which is called em empiric antibiotic prescribing. Now, this is an ideal situation for machine learning, because what I just showed you is a scenario where we have some notion of ground truth. We know which antibiotics would have worked. Um, we just don't have that information at the right time. So we went ahead and we developed a machine learning algorithm which took the information we had on patients and used it to predict which antibiotics would be most successful at resolving this infection. One could then deploy this within an AI recommendation tool within an electronic medical record to give a suggestion of which antibiotic would be appropriate at this point. What we found via our retrospective evaluation is that using this algorithm would result in 20% fewer women being prescribed inappropriate antibiotics, meaning an antibiotic which doesn't actually resolve the infection due to antibiotic resistance. Now, whereas that 20% number uh, is, is useful, I'd say what is even more important is that we can reduce the amount of second-line antibiotic usage by about 50%. That's important because of all the horror stories we see in the media about the growth of these superbugs. Uh, bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics, and if you can reduce the use of your antibiotics of last resort, it can prevent the growth of those superbugs. Now, I mentioned at the very beginning about multiple myeloma, this blood cancer, and let's think about how one today chooses which, which cancer treatment to give a patient who has cancer. Usually, there would be a randomized controlled trial comparing the current standard of, of care to any new treatment. 
And one would use that randomized control trial to say, OK, this treatment works better than this other treatment on average. Now, the future is going to involve algorithms that can take data that you have on patients, past medical history, their um, data that's coming from genomics, from the biopsy of the cancer, and so on, and use that to come up with personalized predictions of how any patient would, would respond to any specific treatment. Now, we could go beyond just thinking about survival. For example, here we're showing a prediction that this particular patient, Jose, um, might, uh, be, might have a much longer survival time under the red treatment than the blue treatment. We could also now th start thinking about, well, what about quality of life? For, ex for example, what's the likelihood that they'll have particular adverse events due, due to the treatments? We could also start thinking about, well, why is it the case? Could we go into a bit of, a, of more detail? If you think about the patient's biomarkers, how might they evolve over time under different treatment options? Now, to do each of those things, one needs good algorithms for making those forecasts of how a patient would respond to any one treatment. And that's exactly what we've been working on here at MIT. So we developed a new class of models that we call deep Markov models that are very good at forecasting the patient's future biomarkers, adverse events, and progression-free survival under each treatment option. So for example, here I'm showing a forecast coming for a single patient, which was not in the training set. We're conditioning on the first 16 months of data for the patient, that's what the black dots are, and we're forecasting the patient's future biomarkers. These are biomarkers very important for understanding multiple myeloma cancer progression. The forecasts of our algorithms are shown in the gray dots there, and what you can see are the ground truth results shown in the blue dots, and how closely we can match the ground truth predictions. You can compare that to earlier algorithms based on more linear modeling approaches, which are shown in red lines there. Now, we've spoken a lot about how AI could augment clinicians, but now let's think about the story from a patient's perspective. How many of you have gone to, a, to see a doctor, have come home, and said, what just happened? <laughs> what was I supposed to do next? What did they say my problem was? What are my treatment choices? Well, today we have an incredible opportunity that the notes written by clinicians that record the record of what happened on that visit are now available to patients. So a patient could go to their patient portal and look at the note, and they might see something that looks a little bit like this for a patient with breast cancer. So now you're in a slightly different situation. Okay, you still don't really understand what happened, and neither do you understand this note, because doctors do not write in a way which patients could understand. And, um, and it's, it's for good reason, because there's a lot of complexity in um, in, in medicine. So we think that there's a, a really interesting opportunity to use AI to help patients better understand their health from the, from the lens of their health records. So in a recent study that we've been doing here at MIT, we've built a browser plugin that patients can use in order to take their notes and, and, and understand them better. So for example, we will translate the notes from clinician speak to patient speak. We will define clinical concepts, and that might be, uh, might be unusual for that patients would already know. And we'll also automatically generate questions and answers, questions that we anticipate patients might have about their medical record and answers that can actually help answer those, those concerns. So just taking a step back now as we start to close, let's think about, well, what do we really need to accelerate AI in healthcare? I gave you the example of using AI to guide cancer treatment selection. And algorithms like that are very data hungry. So they, they really need very detailed information about large numbers of cancer patients, their cancer, and what happened to them. Now, in 1971, the National Cancer Act created the availability of this SEER cancer data, which I, I think is a great example of how we could have data available at scale in the United States. The adoption of electronic medical records I mentioned earlier happened due to the High Tech Act, which gave $29, $27 billion towards adopting electronic medical records. And patients' ability to access their clinical notes was due to the 21st Century Cures Act. So what do we need? Well, I think we need to enforce that providers and payers make that same data available directly to patients' apps, which I think are going to lead to an influx of new AI algorithms to help augment patients. 
And we need to start collecting much higher quality data at scale across the United States for cancer and beyond. Thanks.